uh, tonight we're not going to talk about films like Stunt Rock. And we're not going to talk about The Man from Hong Kong. We're not going to talk about uh, Firebase Gloria and one of his finest. The taking of Firebase Gloria is one of the finest war films ever made with Wings Hauser. We're not going to talk about that one tonight. We are here strictly to talk about Leprechaun films. Until the Q&A, then you can ask them anything you want. Uh, it's, a, it's a big honor to have you here, Brian. Well, thank Please you, set Dennis. the stage. Thank you, Dennis. My son called me this afternoon and said, you may get cancer for this movie. <laughs> <laughs> so, not this, not this much. <laughs> we will see. Uh, but, uh, I, I am and always have been politically incorrect. And I'll not stop it now. Uh, and this is a good example of my id. Uh, uh, I mean, it has sexism. I don't think it has racism, though it does have a black actor doing step and fetch it. But I think that that was a good thing for him to do, because it was a statement that he was making. So, my only point I would like to make about political incorrect humor is there are two sides to it. Sometimes it says something about what it's against, as well as, well as what it appears to be for. Anyway, with that, complex thought. I would like you just to forget about it and have fun and enjoy. Uh, we'll talk about the nuances later. Thank you so much. Uh, and it was. Uh, but I think now that the 
second leprechaun in the hood was not. Uh, anyway, what can I say? Uh, but uh, uh, so you know, I, I had a wonderful time with those producers who just gave me my head uh, and uh, let me do you know what I did. And uh, there was a certain amount of improvisation, but uh, in that film, because uh, I listen to actors who think, well, hey, you know, I, I might add, you know, why did I say this as well? And, and, and so any time that they said something that I thought, oh, that could get a laugh or a smile, then hey, throw it in. <laughs> uh, and uh, so, but it was a, you know, a, it was a great script by Dennis Pratt, my writing partner. We've written 20 things together, which only a few have been made, but um, he re totally rewrote Night of the Demons. He totally rewrote Leprechaun in Vegas for me, and then we collaborated on Leprechaun in Space, and uh, uh, he co-wrote Britannic with me, uh, and uh, uh, you know, various other things uh, that, you know, uh, for which he received no credit, um, uh, uh, Atomic Dog, uh, anyway, uh, but so it was. It was the start of, uh, of a relationship with uh, great producers and a great writer. Uh, but uh, and I, I like horror comedy as well as you know. I like every genre known to man. I hope that uh, maybe one day we will play Turkey Shoot on this yeah. big screen. Yeah. 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 And, well, absolutely. And I hope that one day we'll play the Siege of Firebase Gloria, and I will show you. Bookends that the distributor cut. Now, of course, uh, it's a Yo, damn, let's get Wayne Towser out here and show that one, yeah? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, well, you never know, he's in Carmel raising alpacas, I think. Um, but, uh, yeah. Unfortunately, Leomi is no longer with us, but Leomi, in a way, is immortalized in this film. Uh, because, you know, Tim Colcheri, who plays, you know, the, the sergeant, um, he was originally the drill sergeant in Full Metal Jacket. And Kubrick, you know, when, well, uh, he got a cold and they stopped shooting. And Kubrick watched his technical advisor, R.D. Ermey, who had done small parts in some Philippine shot uh, Vietnam movies. Uh, and was providing technical advice and was also showing how drill sergeants treated um, the, you know, the recruits. And he'd done some tuition to Tim Colcheri about you know, how, he, you know, how he could improv with, with, the, uh, with the recruits. But we watched him drilling the actors. And thought, you know, this guy's better than the guy I hired. So he fired Tim Colcheri which was a terrible blow to him. You know, this could have been a star-making part, as it was for Lee Hermey. Uh, so Tim was given a consolation prize of uh, the mad machine gun, machine gunning the buffaloes uh, from the helicopter. And you know, he stayed in Kubrick's house for another month or so after you know, being discharged. Uh, but he was really hurt by that. It is, psychologically in many ways and uh, uh, it was a wound and I thought you know I'm going to offer the part to Lee and he's going to turn it down but maybe I could find you know yeah I knew the story maybe I could find this guy and I found Tim Colcheri and I said now's your chance you could be that drill sergeant but we're going to play it for comedy but you play it as straight as the, the lines will allow uh, and, uh, so that is how he got to play the part finally, and you know what he said? It really helped me. Uh, it, I finally, I, I, I got it out of my system. Uh, so every now and again, a director does a good thing. Leprechaun Four is like a healing meditation. It's a healing movie, folks. Everyone should see it. <laughs> I, I was uh, I was thinking about my next question, and I I had this like fan moment when I realized you're wearing your Leprechaun 4 yeah. in Space Bomber yeah. right now. <laughs> yeah. Well, there are 50, 50 of these were made for a Midwest video
Neo Wholesalers Convention uh, in the depths of winter. So, okay, that's, that's you know, in addition to you know, you know, food and drink and drugs or whatever they did to get the guys to, to buy you know, large quantities of, uh, of VHS. Uh, uh, yeah. Let's give them jackets so they, they're warm uh, when they come to the convention. Uh, so I managed to get a, uh, you know, a couple, uh, one for each of my sons and one for me. Uh, it's 1995 and I don't have a tear in it yet. Uh, it, they, they were made to last. Uh, and uh, and it, it's, it's an excellent thing to be playing, to be wearing in the sort of Oregon uh, late you know, autumn, winter, etc. So uh, um, I, I can be seen wearing leprechaun in space. Uh, I, I, I go to Freddy's. And, uh, the, uh, the, uh, I'm bending over with a steel head saying, can I have that piece? It's not as different out there in Scappoos. Uh, uh, your, your, son, your son actually has a, a tiny part in this movie. Do you want to tell him about your son's uh, uh, rendition of the uh, spaceship? Which I oh, yes, know. yes. He, 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 he did the basic design of the spaceship. Um, How old was he at the time? Oh, goodness, he was 95. He, he, 14, yes. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, he, um, he actually was a, a brilliant artist, uh, uh, but uh, he, um, he, I said, Eric, please, do me a design for the spaceship, and he just roughed something in pretty quickly, and I took it to the producers, and they said, oh, this is good, and we did it. He, he, he refined it a bit more, and they gave him the design, and then they modeled it, and turned it into the spaceship. Uh, so that was good, and, uh, and as a result, he helped me a bit on um, on Megiddo, a Mega Code Two yeah. film, a film that, well, of course, you can get it on YouTube, but it doesn't look bad on the fifty foot sheet. I can tell you, <laughs> when 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 uh, you yeah, know Pentecostal church wants to spend twenty million dollars, um, please give it to me. Uh, and I will make it look good on the big screen. That is my nature. Uh, and, uh, and, and anyway, so, um, but uh, so he, yeah, that was my little contribution. I mean, my sons have made contributions to Night of the Demons too because it's their super soakers that are firing holy water at the demons and causing them to melt. Uh, so, yeah, my, my children were early warriors against Satan. Uh, and, uh, yeah, uh, and, uh, yeah, following in the father's footsteps. Uh, but, um, anyway, uh, so, but it, so that's the family connection. Um, and uh, I, I want to ask you about one of my favorite scenes in the film, which is at the very end. Uh, I don't know, I, I, I keep calling Brian brilliant. He really is truly brilliant. I'm not trying yeah. to kiss him. Yeah. Well, yeah. Brian is a brilliant filmmaker, and I'll tell you why, just, from, just, just for a moment. Uh, he's worked in almost every genre that you can think of. He's worked with the most difficult kind of filming. He's worked with wild animals. He's worked with children. He's worked with wild stunts, car crashes. He's flown somebody over an Australian city. <laughs> I mean, martial art fights, he's done everything. But one of my favorite scenes in Leprechaun 4 is at the very end. Uh, when Warwick Davis becomes giant. Yes. And this is an incredible moment of, because he's worked with CGI, uh, and he's also done incredible things, obviously, with practical effects, but that scene in particular is incredible. Yeah, it's something I always wanted to do. I mean, I, I wrote it into the script. Dennis and I just would brainstorm what is, okay, well, what's the next crazy thing we can do? Because, you know, I, I mean, Trimark had said, hey, well, we've got to do another one because that one in, in Vegas was the highest selling directed video of 1995. Yeah! Which is shipping 55,000 units, which is pretty good for a non studio director video. Yeah, you know. And for the record, part three was supposed to end as a trilogy, but Brian directed such a fine film, they kept it going. <laughs> not, not bad for 14 days, anyway. Well, that, that, 
they had a really unit in Space Vegas. It was supposed to be the end, uh, but they said you had to do another one. And at a Trimark Christmas party, uh, they had, of course, they had created a fake poster with Apollo 13 and the leprechaun popping out of Apollo 13. Who's going to be hell a problem? Uh, and they said, well, what about that? And I said, well, you know, the Apollo 13 is a little restrictive for space in terms of all the things you could get up to. Why don't we forget Apollo 13? Let's go for aliens as the formula. Let's have a group of space marines hunting a creature who happens to be a leprechaun with a lightsaber and a shillelagh. So they said, well, okay. So, uh, and I have had a lot of rope, you see, at this time, because you know, I, I made them some money. Uh, and so I was duly summoned into a meeting with the hierarchy of Trimark, including the boss, Mark Armin, who um, uh, uh, had made a big success out of this direct video company. And uh, he was a person that his executives took very seriously. And uh, uh, so we all sat down around the conference table, and I went in, and the producer, Jeff Gaffray, was there beside me, and Jonathan Kopak Martin, who went on to Deadpool uh, and things like that later. Anyway, luckily, he, he, he liked it. But other executives around the, the, the table, they all wanted their fingers on the next one creatively. Um, and uh, so uh, they all had ideas. But anyway, I was asked to pitch my idea. And they, uh, Mark came in and said, OK, tell me the best scene. I said, well, you know, this is like aliens. So we've got to have you know, something like the chest burster scene. He said, oh, well, that's been imitated you know, many times in many films. I said, not like this. <laughs> I was a little polite with the horror. 
<laughs> because I wanted it to sort of fit in with the, uh, the tone of the absurdist comedy that I was making. But then if you go for too much unpleasant blood, as opposed to, ooh, look at that interesting makeup effect, or uh, uh, whatever, it, it, yeah, you could, there could be a, you know, a disconnect with the tone. So I didn't have gushes of blood. Uh, it, it, there were, it, it, Leprechaun 2 is gorier than Leprechaun 4, let's say. And Leprechaun 2 is either boring, uh, it was meant to be bright of Leprechaun, but uh, anyway. And I do hope whoever's shooting this is not going to put it on YouTube because I'm saying unpleasant nope. things about other uh, <laughs> I was asking about my favorite scene, which was the miniature scene, but since you brought up the whole, like, like cockburster scene that we, as we call it in the house, <laughs> I have to tell you, uh, instead of chestburster. Yes, yes, uh, yes, yes, yes. yes. Uh, you, you, you have an encyclopedic knowledge of cinema. Uh, we, we've had dinner and you, I remember us having a conversation about the use of squids in movies and we were like, what? <laughs> uh, but this movie is kind of like your 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 love poem to sci-fi and well, horror yeah. cinema. It's a pastiche of sci-fi parody, uh, you know, shoehorned into you know an alleged exploitation franchise, uh, uh, in which I hope hopefully I can show my love of sci-fi and everyone's love that obviously was expressed tonight by your response. Thank you very much. <laughs> See, I, I have never seen it with an audience other than uh, the key uh, crew, not all the crews, but the key crew came to the screening for Mark Amin and the Trimark executives of my, my cut with a temp soundtrack. Uh, they didn't quite know what to make of it, but uh, it was much, it, it, it had, the crew were all laughing, and I don't think they were expecting so many laughs, but they thought, oh, well, that's, yeah, that's probably because they were part of the movie and they, they made the movie, so uh, maybe it's scarier than we think. And I, and I scored the, the temp track with, you know, uh, yeah, music from Aliens. Uh, uh, but uh, Dennis Tenney did a, a good job of, uh, you know, five, five grand. You know, um, uh, and I, my only direction to him was, you know, I'd like to have a sort of semi-comedic march uh, that the Marines could march along to, and just listen to so many Morricone marches, uh, from some, not from the Dollars Pictures, but from some of his other films that he, that he scored. Uh, and there's, you know, he, 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 the Inglorious Bastards march. Yeah. You get it. This was 95. There's a tiny hint of that kind of uh, march. I mean, he, he plucked it from, uh, from uh, uh, yeah, one of any of our counties. Uh, it wasn't the Battle of Algiers. It was... Anyway, I think you could probably, musicologists might, might be able to find the derivation here for that one in Space Store. Or <laughs> perhaps that could be the subject of uh, you know, somebody's PhD. <laughs> You made this movie for 1.6 million dollars, but it looks kind of huge on a 50 foot screen tonight. I mean, it looks well, great. Yeah. Know how to exploit your location. Uh, and we, we had a warehouse uh, at, uh, in Burbank, and we had some leftover uh, parts of sets that, uh, from movies that Trimark had made, one of many. Koto directed a, some kind of a sci-fi film, I forget what, it had a bit of a, it, 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 it had a bit of an alien planet maybe, it, it, it also had uh, underground chambers of burrow, something that burrowed through the rocks and was a science, fic, a science lab. Uh, anyway, we had bits and pieces of that left over and we put it together and made our sort of bits of the planet and then bits of the the science lab and, and so forth, uh, and the the you know the nature of the warehouse was that we could put up gantries and it's very easy to turn it into something that the same design principle of an alien had that sort of use a whole lot of used aircraft parts for corridors and things and uh, you know people with 
a bit of you know, inventive lighting, but it's fine. Uh, so yeah, we, we did well. We shot for 18 days uh, in that warehouse, uh, and uh, we made little sort of uh, cubicles for the actors to have their private moments in and so forth. Um, and we, also, we, we didn't have to have trailers and things like that. Uh, but in low budget, you can't get away with that. You can't anymore. Uh, but uh, uh, so 18 days uh, shot uh, everything you see except the cargo bay miniatures. We dressed part of the, of the warehouse to be the cargo bay. We put cargo in it, uh, and then we got we created miniatures of that cargo. And we had a set that was this high and about 20 foot long. And it fitted Warwick nicely. Uh, and I had pre-planned the whole sequence, uh, uh, shot for shot, so that before we got to it, we knew all the bits that we had to get in the miniature set. Uh, we had, did all the shots where uh, the, you know, the hero and the heroine were running around, uh, and shots where we could bring his, we could match his giant hand in occasionally. Um, and then all we needed was um, split screens and POVs from the miniature uh, set uh, that would integrate you know, you know, Warwick with them. Uh, and uh, so it was good. Uh, and it, it, for two days we shot in that miniature set. So it was a 20 day shoot, though 18 of it was full crew. Uh, you know, two days of it was 10 people. Uh, and, and Warwick had a great time, though he did think. He didn't realize until he saw it that it was quite as wild and crazy as it was. <laughs> and he didn't, he, he, let's say, he, he, did, he was not sure whether that was going to be a success. And because uh, the Leprechaun movies were never given much of a release in the UK, first one was released theatrically and bombed. Second one, Leprechaun 2, well, we can't call it Leprechaun. Let's call it four, four funerals and a wedding, because it was the same year that they had released four weddings and a funeral. Uh, uh, so, uh, so Leprechaun Three came on, and they, they didn't even bother to release that. Uh, and then I think when there was a fourth, they did it. It just went straight to video, like like uh, uh, like Leprechaun in space. In France, I, they released it as a space platoon. <laughs> uh, and I, I don't know whether they tried to, I, 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 I'd love to see that French DVD, did they, did they get the comedy? Did they try and make it into aliens? <laughs> you, you weirdly came around to talking to me about the scene that I love, which is the miniature scene. Uh, and I don't know if the audience knows this, but you worked with one of uh, cinema's heroes, Ray Harryhausen. Well, I never worked. Well, I worked on trailers for films he made. I made, I made the trailer for Valley of Guanji, uh, in Cowboys versus uh, versus Dinosaurs, uh, and it was, you know, not one of his most successful, uh, you know, stop motion animations. Uh, but yeah, you know, it was pretty good. It had some actually technically quite difficult stuff because Ray Harryhausen was always trying to push the envelope seeing how many different layers uh, he could get into it. Uh, incidentally, on Facebook, I just posted a 12-minute mini-doc of the original King Kong. It gives you a quick thumbnail sketch of how Willis O'Brien, who was Ray Harryhausen's mentor, um, designed or created the, the, the whole stop motion effects for, you know, and, and how he applied them to the you know, King Kong, which is, so, you know, holds up today. But no, Ray, Ray Harryhausen was great, and uh, um, he, he really knew, knew how to put magic on the screen. Uh, and uh, so, uh, it was a great influence on you know so many filmmakers of my generation. Well, you know how to put magic on the screen too. Well, yes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, right there with the green hat. Happy St. Patrick's. The wearing of the dream.
Green. Phil Green, yes. Thank you indeed to goodness we are. What do you have to say? <laughs> Anything specific I want to keep in my head? Yeah, well, specific mind. every day is how do I get the day done? <laughs> uh, but I mean, do you mean thematically or in creative terms? Yeah, hard to describe this. Um, I mean, it's kind of like oh god. Uh, so is there just any? I don't know how to explain this. Well, well, the sure. creative process is a hard thing to explain. Uh, and I just had, you know, I, I, I'm a child of Monty Python. So I am into absurdist humor. Uh, I find, you know, human folly uh, uh, amusing to watch. And I, human hypocrisy, you know, institutional hypocrisy, government hypocrisy, um, clerical hypocrisy, and the whole laundry list. Uh, but so I, I, you know, I, I, I try to get some of my little, you know, personal quotes into my, my films. Uh, but it's, you know, I, I have, you know, a particular kind of, I have a sense of humor that I want to put into a film when it's appropriate. A film like this, Odin Slabber. You know, find all the jokes you can. Uh, a more serious film, like some of my war films, Samara, Siege of Firebase, Gloria, Britannic, plays great. Uh, but Siege has a, a vein of black comedy that is very, very carefully below the surface because, you know, otherwise it would affect the tone and the seriousness of the film. Uh, but, so I, 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 first of all, I, Try to think, what does the audience want to see from this? How can I give it to them? And how can I give it to them in, in great volume? Uh, how can I give them more than they expect? And I hope you got a little bit more than you expected yeah. when you came. Yeah. For those of you who haven't seen it. Uh, so I mean, so, uh, spent hours trying to explain the creative process, and you'd be just as mystified. Uh, but it, being, being a filmmaker, is you have to have a vision, you have to be a good team leader, uh, and you have to be a problem solver because not everything goes to plan. The, who are, hands up? Who was in the in the recorded <laughs> entertainment business here? Many, any of you? Wow, all of you. Yeah, one, two, one, three. two, three. Yes. Three, three. Well, good for you. Thank you. 
meaning no disrespect to all the great editors that have worked with me. I started as an editor. I started cutting news when I was 20, in the days of 16 millimeter splices and minders. Get it on to tell a cine by 6.30 or you'll get your, you know. So, uh, anyway, it was fun. Uh, but if you can cut news, you can cut anything. And then I went on to station promos, because I said, your station promos are dull, you know, the way a 21-year-old <laughs> speaks to station managers. Uh, and they said, okay, well, you have a go. And I said, all right, I'll do it on overtime after the news. Um, and uh, so I was racking up two hours a night of overtime until they decided I was paying, being paid almost as much as, um, you know, a well-paid executive. So we can't have that. Anyway, so, but eventually another network stole me. I made promos for them, and my promos were considered to be you know, extremely violent and, uh, and different. Uh, they won the ratings. Uh, it was the year of the Mod Squad. Uh, and, uh, uh, Star Trek, the first season of the Star Trek, original Star Trek, and uh, Ironside. And anyway, so those violent promos got me a job with an American company making trailers in Europe, in, young, in London in particular. And tra trailer making was the real foundation of my education. How to make a film look good in two minutes. Well, can you then reverse the process? Can you expand it back out to 90 or 100? Uh, and uh, so I, I learned a lot from that experience I made. Well, I stopped counting after, after 100 trailers. Uh, I don't do them anymore. Um, it stopped in the 90s, but they were a nice parallel career. And I think everyone has to develop parallel careers in this business. Uh, but uh, so uh, I, I know whether that helps in any way with the, the creative process and, and how I, I how I work, but I, I shoot as an editor. Uh, I don't shoot a shot that I don't think I'm gonna use a second or two of, uh, and hopefully more. Um, though some shots, some even insert shots, that's all they need to run, uh, if they're tight enough. Sometimes you predicted what the sensor sensor would cut and you yes. overshot. Yes. So that you know, by the time yeah. they cut your movie, you were like, "That's how I." Remember. I'm in the demons too. When uh, yeah, Angela, Queen of the Demons, yeah, <laughs> says to uh, yeah, the poor guy, uh, Lad, he, 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 <laughs> who means terribly, he means his device later as well in the, this film. But uh, how about a little head, Tiger? Yeah, and then she is, you know, swipe, it, it takes his head off with her, uh, her cookery. Uh, and uh, it's a good piece of And the head bounces on the, the floor. He, he, he sinks to the ground, blood squirting from his severed neck. We had a special suit with shoulders you know, built in so that he could conceal his head from shot from behind. <laughs> We would conceal his head so we could have fake stuff with blood pouring out. So uh, I, I put f twice as many shots into the cut we submitted to the MPAA, knowing that they would cut, would cut. They don't like beheadings. I don't understand that. I love beheadings. It's a really good beheading. Uh, it's a Russian film. It's an amazing beheading. Don't get me started. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know the do his editing work yeah. for him. Well, and so I, I knew if I just submitted chop, bounce, uh, and end the story, they would have chopped one of those two shots. So I put in far too much, and they said, dramatically reduce the number of yeah, head, seven headshots and spurting blood. So I cut half of them out, and they said, fine, thank you. And, 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 and they were too many. Creatively, they were wrong. But I let them fix my creative mistake. Hey, uh, we, we only have time for one more question. And who should it be? You said, what? Pick them. Go for it, go for it. Um, well, I mean, it's get her done, you know, uh, 18 days, strict 12-hour days, no overtime, um, and, you know, I think 
of ours is quite long enough. Uh, and you know, accidents happen when people are tired. So these 16 hour days, you, know, you heard of you know, what, what happened on Babylon, people working 16 to 19 hour days, um, uh, and you know, people had car crashes. You know, we all know about accidents on the set, so hours should always be kept to 110, 112 rather. Anyway, so getting it done, and with, with prosthetic effects, it's in the execution of the effect. The, the prosthetic can be brilliant, but if you don't quite like it right, or you know, the movement doesn't kind of feel right, or it catches when the, the, the prosthetic has to be moved in some way in front of the camera, uh, you, you've got to fiddle with it and make sure that, it will, that for those critical two, three, four seconds you're going to use that shot, that it is as, as photo real as it possibly can be and believable. So, uh, and sometimes you'll, you'll spend an extra 20 minutes getting that right, and it's only going to be a three second shot. It's going to be a, well, you could say it could be a money shot, but every shot's money. Um, but, uh, so you have to make these things yeah, the uh, analogy. <laughs> yeah, but uh, anyway, so that, that's part of it. And also management. I mean, I, my, uh, my guy playing a sort of subdued Sylvester Stallone. And I, 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 I could have had him ramp up the accent. He was ready to do it. But my producers were concerned that Stallone would sue us. Because he had the look. He deserved to do it. That kind of stuff. He, he showed me a Stallone in the picture. Oh, wow, that's good. But uh, the producer said, whoa, we might get in trouble here. Uh, so, anyway, that's what we did. But he, Brett Jasmine, former uh, soap opera star, uh, the young and the vapid or something. Uh, and Jessica Collins uh, did not like each other. This happens quite often, romantic leads, where they're meant to suddenly look into each other's eyes and, ah, you know, kiss it. Um, not in fact, no. Uh, she did, I, I, it was good to see her performance again after so many years. I, you know, she was not easy to deal with, but she was very good. I think she hit every comedy beat she milked every shot she was in. Uh, as for all it was worth, she understood what could be done with the text. I love that in an actor. She was just a little bit difficult, uh, but you know, I don't. You know, she, you know, and she, she probably thought that we were all stupid. I don't know. Uh, but she did a good job, uh, and I, I'm even more pleased with uh, seeing it again on a 50-foot sheet. Uh, than I was at the end of every shooting day. I would say, that was great, Jessica. I would report. You always have to tell your actors when they're good and, and then tell them why they were good in that particular moment in case they think you're flattering them. So you have to, yeah. Anyway, it's, uh, but, so there was, that was a little bit of, you know, uh, yeah, a little bit of group therapy I would have to do every now and again with, with cast. Um, but, uh, it was otherwise a very happy shoot, and Guy Siner, who you know, plays Dr. Mittenhead, who, you know, uh, was quite a, a name in British television, if you've ever seen Arlo Arlo, on, uh, yeah, it's a, a comedy about the French resistance. <laughs> Old childhood friend of yours, no? Yeah, we went to school together, so I thought, okay, how can I punish you, Guy? Uh, <laughs> you're a Nazi cyborg. <laughs> yes, would you, would you like to be a Nazi mad scientist who gets turned into a spider scorpion? Uh, and, well, he said, well, I'm an actor. Uh, and and uh, so, it, it, uh, I love Guy, and we, we talk from time to time, and they, he said, I, you know, um, <laughs> he, 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 during the shoot, he hated me, me and Gabe Bartolis, who put him through six hours of makeup every day. So, with six hours of makeup can make me hate a childhood friend. Uh, but he forgave me, and my next part of him was to make him the corrupt Prime Minister of England uh, in uh, Omega Code 2, which he really appreciated. Uh, and, uh, um, and, and the guy I cast as the Russian Premier, I cast him to look like Putin in 2000. Wow. Take a look. I 
first time you predicted some weird political well, stuff. I, but I, 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 it was a logical thing. He just <laughs> achieved this ascendancy within the, 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 the what was you know the reformed you know Russian Republic and the Federation. And, uh, so hey, you know, who is the Russian prime minister president? Oh, it's that guy. Get a, get an actor who looks like him. Well, anyway. So anyone who watches it may go to. It's, it's a hoot and a holler. Uh, uh, <laughs> we're getting, we're, we have to go. We have to wrap up. I'm sorry. I could keep you here all.